In Path of Radiance, every Laguz class and promoted Beorc class has access to a skill known as their Occult Skill. So named because you need to use an Occult Scroll to teach that skill, though some people call them Mastery Skills. These are this game's so-called Ultimate Attacks. I say so-called because the majority of them are pretty bad. But I'm going to be discussing them anyway for completeness sake. How they work, what they do, and who you should use your limited number of occult scrolls on. Yes, there are a limited number of these. You only get a maximum of four per playthrough, though most players will miss number two. The first is obtained from a chest in chapter 13. The second is obtained from a base conversation in chapter 16, which is unlocked by recruiting Stefan in the previous chapter. The third is in the inventory of a recruitable character in Chapter 21, while the final one is held by the boss of Chapter 27. So, all in all, four Occult Scrolls, four potential mastery skills learned in one playthrough. Before I cover them individually, I want to go over some traits that are common to all mastery skills. As I said, they can only be learned by promoted Beorc classes. Laguz can learn theirs at any time. Secondly, all mastery skills cost exactly 20 capacity, which means for mounted units it'll take up all of it, and for unmounted units they'll only have 5 capacity left. It's a pretty big investment that's usually not worth it. Most of these skills, though not all of them, are activation based skills. These have a certain percent chance of activating per attack. And if the RNG takes favour on you, the skill activates. You'll know when it does, there's a very flashy animation. Now, all mastery skills can activate at any range. One range, two range, even three range if you're a sniper using a longbow. There are two exceptions though. Swords can never trigger mastery skills at range, only in melee combat. This applies to both magic swords and two physical based range swords we'll be seeing later in the game. Also, mastery skills cannot activate for ballistas or long range tomes. Also, I know that almost all mastery skills can critical, though it's not really reflected in the animation, and I know for a fact that most can miss. I have definitive video evidence of Ethan missing, by the way. With that out of the way, let's go over all the mastery skills. It's only fitting that the main character would get easily the best occult skill in the game, and one of the only ones that's actually worth it, Ether. If you know Ike at all, I'm sure you'll have heard of this skill. It's learned by Ike's promoted Lord class, meaning that he can have it any time starting with Chapter 18, and technically heroes can also learn it, but you never get a playable hero. This was Ether's first appearance in the series, and it hasn't changed much since then in terms of effect. When activated, Ether turns one attack into two attacks, much like a Dep. The first attack has a soul effect, and so recovers HP equal to the damage dealt, and the second has a lunar effect, so calculates damage at half the enemy's defense. Giving Ike two attacks, healing him, and doing more damage, what's not to like about this skill? It's also even better than it is in most of its other appearances in the series, because its activation chance is skill percent, not skill over 2%. At maximum, Ike has a 27% chance of activating this per attack, which is really not bad. Not only does this skill make Ike better in combat all round, it's also how the game expects you to beat both the Black Knight and the final boss. Though there are other skill combinations that work, and that's what I'm going to get to now. The one downside of Aether is, there may be other skill combinations that are better for Ike in the long run. One of them is Adept and Wrath. That gives you the same chance of activating two attacks for half the capacity, while also giving you an at least 50% chance of criticaling while Ike is under half HP. This skill combination can also beat the Black Knight, though it's a lot more recommended on normal than it is on hard for reasons that I'll get to when I cover that fight. Also, unlike Aether, Adept can activate at range. The other combination for Ike that's generally considered better, especially against the final boss, is Wrath Resolve. This absolutely wrecks the final boss and is by far the fastest way to beat him. However, you don't get the Resolve Scroll until Chapter 27, which means you only have access to this combination for two chapters, whereas you have access to Aether for almost half the game. 
All in all, Aether is by far the best mastery skill. If you're going to use an occult on anyone, you might as well use one on Ike. Soul, the first half of Aether. Even alone, it's still pretty good. It's the occult skill for Paladins and also Mist when she's promoted, but really, you don't want her to be fighting much anyway. Plus, she can't activate it at range with magic swords, whereas Paladins can trigger it at range with javelins and hand axes. Its effect is simple, but very good. It restores HP equal to the damage you do to the enemy. It doesn't do any additional damage, but that healing can really help. And if you put a Paladin with this skill on the front lines, they can be pretty much invincible. And considering how good Paladins are in this game, having an invincible Paladin is definitely a big asset. For those reasons, Soul is generally agreed to be the only mastery skill that's actually worth it besides Aether. If you're using a very Paladin heavy team, you might as well just stick Soul on everyone. It's not like the occult skills would be better served elsewhere. Luna, the other half of Aether, and a pretty simple skill overall. This one's learned by both Generals and Halberdiers. It has a skill percent chance of activating, which is pretty decent, and when it does, it calculates damage at half the enemy's defense, or resistance if you're using a magic weapon. Luna is an okay occult skill. It's far from the worst, and if you have a spare occult scroll, you can do worse than teach this, but it's not amazing. Most of the time it doesn't add all that much damage, unless the enemy has really, really high defense, such as certain generals or feral one dragons later in the game. I also tend to find this skill more effective on generals than it is on halberdiers, but that's mostly because Nephany has to give up wrath in order to learn Luna, and you really don't want to do that. For generals though, most of them don't start with any skills. And they tend not to double attack very much, so doing extra damage can sometimes give them one-shots they wouldn't otherwise get. Also, the Black Knight has this skill, and it's pretty scary to go up against. But when you're using it, it's not amazing. But it's not terrible either, so you can use this one if you really want to. Ah, Astra, one of the most iconic occult skills in the series, and in this game one of the most controversial. It's the occult skill of Swordmasters, and it does what it usually does in the series. Lets you attack five times, though each hit is at half normal damage. It does have one of the lowest activation rates at skill over 2%, so you won't be seeing this that often. And when it does activate, well it looks cool, but when you think about it, 5 hits at half damage is really only 2.5 times normal damage, which is worse than a critical. But what slightly makes up for that is that even though the animation might not reflect it, any one of these 5 hits can be a critical. And given how high the crit rates on Swordmasters tend to be, it's likely that at least 2 of them will be, and that will outdamage a regular critical hit. There are a few issues with this skill, however. The first is that every hit consumes weapon durability, so this can run your weapon uses down quite a lot. Also, it can make you take more weapon uses than normal to kill an enemy. Say that you have an enemy with 20 HP, and you're doing 10 damage per attack. Normally, it'd only take you 2 weapon uses to kill the enemy. But say you hit once and then trigger Astra on the second attack. You've already done 10 damage, and each hit of Astra does 5. This means you're now taking three hits to kill the enemy rather than two, and so you consume one more weapon use than you should have. The second weakness is its capacity. 20 is a lot of capacity to give up, and you could easily spend that on skills like Vantage, Wrath, Adept, Resolve, all of which are probably better than Astra in the long run. Speaking of Vantage and Adept, in order to teach Mia and Zhark Astra, you need to remove those starting skills from them, which is not recommended as those skills are really good. And Stefan already comes with Astra, so there's no reason to use an occult on him. So when you think about it, there's really only one Swordmaster in the game you'd want to teach Astra to. And they're easily the worst Swordmaster in the game, in fact one of the worst characters in the game. So all of that definitely lands Astra in awesome yet impractical territory. It's decent on Stefan, at least. And as far as occult skills go, it's not the worst, but it's not great either. Flare is the occult skill of sages and bishops, essentially promoted magic users. It's pretty simple, it has a skill percent chance of activating, and when it does, it calculates damage as if the enemy had half of its resistance stats. Essentially, it's Luna, but for magic. While this isn't that bad of an effect, 
it's not really all that useful in this game because most enemies have such low resistance that halving it won't make much difference in how much damage you do. Most of the time, you're far better off with Adept, which will do more damage, have the same activation rate, and cost half the capacity. It's got a cool animation, I guess, but it's really not necessary. Also, I'm pretty sure it can't activate with knives, not that you really want it to. Colossus is the mastery skill of Warriors and Berserkers, and it's the first one to have unique conditions for its activation. It's a skill percent chance, but in order to even have a chance of working, your weight needs to be higher than the targets. This already makes the skill not all that great, because Boyd isn't as heavy as you think he is. Even with a statue frag, he ends up tying generic enemy warriors in weight, and that's not enough to get the bonus on them. And remember how insane the weight stats on mounted units and flyers are? Yeah, you're not activating Colossus against them. Even worse, Feral One Lagoos also have more than enough weight to negate Colossus, and you'll be facing a lot of these later on too, so really, there aren't many enemies that Colossus works on. And even when it does work, its effect is kind of underwhelming. You do 1.25 times damage, which is worse than a critical. We will be getting a Berserker later in the game, who's a bit heavier than Boyd is, but even he is not activating Colossus against Cavalry or Feral Ones. The general consensus I see with this skill is that the extra damage isn't bad, but it's overkill. Boyd and the Berserker we'll be getting later already do way more than enough damage. They don't need to do any more. I think this skill has an interesting concept, I just wish it was more effective. Fun fact, the game's unused data suggests that Wrath was originally planned to be the mastery skill for Warriors and Berserkers, which would make sense given that it was a class skill for them in Thrakia 776 and later became a class skill for them in Awakening. Stun is the mastery skill of all promoted flyers, so Falcon Knights, Wyvern Lords, and one spoiler class that we haven't seen yet. And you're probably thinking, flyers are always broken in Fire Emblem games, surely their ultimate skill must be broken too, right? Actually, Stun is one of the worst mastery skills in the game, and that's really saying something. Firstly, its activation rate is only skill over 2%, meaning that at best you've got about a 14% chance of triggering it. Secondly, its effect is absolute garbage. It inflicts shock status on the enemy for one turn. Well, technically two turns, but it wears off at the start of the second enemy phase, so it's really only one turn where it's effective. This skill prevents the enemy from moving, and I mean that in an exact word sense. The enemy cannot move. This skill doesn't say anything about the enemy being able to do things that aren't moving, they just can't move. Even if this skill prevented the enemy from doing everything on the next turn, it'd still be pretty bad. When I'm having flyers fight enemies, I want the enemy to die, not get stunned for a turn. And if in general I want an enemy out of action for a turn, I would rather kill them than stun them. But what makes this already bad skill even worse is the fact that shock status only prevents moving. They can still take any other action besides movement. They can trade, they can use items, they can even attack. Yep, stunned enemies can still attack in this game, so this skill is pretty terrible, don't teach it. On top of the fact that it'll take up your flyer's entire capacity and means you won't be able to use things like Savior, don't use this skill. <sighs> Intelligent systems, why must you insist on giving snipers skills that increase their hit rates? You should know by now that snipers don't need any more help hitting things! In case you couldn't tell by my reaction, Deadeye is a terrible, terrible skill and you should never use it, but I'll explain it anyway. Deadeye is the mastery skill for snipers. Its activation rate is skill over 2%, which is already pretty bad, but its effects are really bizarre. In fact, I had to do a bit of research to find out exactly what it does, because many websites have it wrong. This skill is actually a hybrid passive skill and offensive skill. While it's equipped to a character, that character always has doubled accuracy. Which in the case of snipers means they'll probably never miss anything, but it's not like they needed help hitting things anyway. When it activates, it puts the enemy to sleep. That's all it does. Technically speaking, sleep is at least better than the stun skill, but 
it's still not worth using 20 capacity on, and overall it's just a really, really bad skill. The one good thing I can say about it is that it looks awesome. And now we come to the one reason why I couldn't give a video on mastery skills until now, lethality. This is the mastery skill of assassins, and thus only Volk, therefore I consider this skill's existence to be kind of a spoiler. You'll probably know what lethality is if you're a Fire Emblem fan, but fun fact, this was the first game to actually call it that. It was called Silencer in the GBA games. Lethality works how it always does in the series, it instantly kills the enemy. Even if you would normally be doing no damage, the enemy will instantly die. However, in this game, it does not work on bosses, which already hurts its usefulness a little bit. What really hurts its usefulness though is its activation rate. It's the exact same as it is in the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem games. If you get a critical, there's a 50% chance that it will be lethality. Thus, its activation rate is effectively your crit rate over 2. In the GBA games, you could use killing edges and supports to give yourself very high lethality rates, but that's just not possible in Path of Radiance, because assassins use knives, and knives are terrible in this game. The best crit rate you can get out of a knife at base is 10. That's already not great. Having an assassin with maxed out skill gives an extra 15 critical, so that makes a maximum possible crit rate of 25%. Lethality is half that, so roughly 12%. And that's assuming the enemy has zero luck, which in this game almost nothing does. So in practice, your lethality rates are going to be no higher than 10%, probably even single digits most of the time. It's cool when it works, but it's very much awesome but impractical. You're not going to be seeing this skill very often. If only there were daggers with better crit rates, then this would have been more useful, but sadly there aren't. That being said, this skill is one of Volk's main assets, so if you're training him, you might as well give him this skill. It's not great, but it's not like you have much other use for occult skills, and a Volk with even a 5% chance of insta-killing everything is still better than nothing. And now we get into the Lagoo's mastery skills, of which Roar is a very unique one. It's learnable by all three Beast Tribe classes, Cat, Tiger, and Lion. Unlike most mastery skills, this one isn't activation based. You choose when to use this, and it's not even used in combat. If you move adjacent to an enemy, you have the option to use Roar from a menu. You can only do this once per chapter though. Roar paralyzes the enemy for one turn. This is essentially a better version of the stun skill. Paralyzed enemies can't move, but unlike with stun, they can't attack or take any other action either essentially rendering the enemy useless for one turn. But it suffers from the same problem the stun skill does. Namely, if I wanted an enemy to be a non-threat for one turn, I would just kill them. And many characters who learn this skill are more than capable of doing that, so... I don't really see much point to using this, and only once per chapter too? It's really not that useful. I can only think of one use for Roar in the entire game, and that's in chapter 22. There's one enemy who you want to keep alive, who will very easily suicide himself into your units if you let him. Roar can prevent him from doing that. Other than that, I really don't see any time where Roar would be good. Unlike these tribes, bird tribes don't share occult skills. And the hawk occult skill is the only one I'll be discussing in detail here. It's Cancel. This is a little bit confusing since the guard skill is called Cancel in Japanese and in Radiant Dawn. And there's a skill in Radiant Dawn with the same effect as Cancel here, and it's called Paviz. Yay, consistency. But anyway, Cancel in Path of Radiance is the one example of a defensive occult skill in this game. It has a skill percent chance of activating, not when you attack, but when the enemy attacks. And if it works, it reduces the enemy's incoming attack to zero damage. If you're familiar with Genealogy or Sacred Stones, this skill is effectively Great Shield with a better activation rate, and it's actually one of the better mastery skills overall. The problem though, is whether or not Janeth and Ulki are good enough to use an occult on. If you are using either of them, this skill is pretty great, but... They're not the best characters overall, and the one really really good Hawk that we'll be getting later in the game already starts with Cancel. 
So really, cancel is a good skill, but with lackluster recipients. There are three more occult skills in the game, however I won't be covering them in that much detail, because you never need to use an occult to learn them. Every character you recruit who can have these skills already starts with them. As this video was more meant as a guide as to which occult skills are worth using the scrolls on, discussing these here is a little irrelevant. But Blessing is pretty decent, Boon is not great, but it can help sometimes, and Vortex is pretty lackluster, honestly. And that's all I can really say about occult skills. Yeah, sadly most of them are pretty terrible. The only two that I consider unambiguously good are Aether and Soul. And even then, there might be better skill combinations on Ike than Aether. So really, if you're using a lot of Paladins, just teach Soul to everyone. But as for other occult skills I'd recommend, cancel if you're using the Hawks, Luna on Generals is not bad, and if you're using Volk, you might as well give him Lethality. But those two cases are only because it's not like there are many better uses for Occult Scrolls. Most of the other Occult Skills are so bad that you should never consider using them, unless you want to see the flashy animations. Radiant Dawn, on the other hand, went the exact opposite route with Occult Skills, but that's neither here nor there. But here in Path of Radiance, honestly, you'll probably struggle to end up using all four Occult Scrolls.